Good afternoon, everyone. So while preparing for this session, I went to my most trusted resources for research. So I'm still on Harvard's campus, so I could go to the famous Widener or Lamont libraries or the library at the Graduate School of Education where I am enrolled. No, I went to the Google and I looked up the definition of Lent. And here is what I found. Lent is a season of reflection and preparation before the celebrations of Easter. By observing the 40 days of Lent, Christians replicate Jesus Christ's sacrifice and withdrawal into the desert for 40 days. Easter, when Jesus made the great sacrifice to die on the cross so that the rest of us could live. Then this led me to investigate how great of a sacrifice was this? Because it should be true that our reflection and preparation is comparable to the depth and breadth and greatness of the sacrifice. So how great was Jesus Christ's sacrifice on Easter Sunday? To answer this question, I actually reflected on Christmas maybe because of the deep Arctic freeze outside my window was more reminiscent of Christmas than springtime and Easter tulips. Nonetheless, the answer to the question, how great was Jesus Christ's sacrifice came to me when I contemplated one particular gift the baby Jesus received from the three wise men, myrrh. Myrrh was used to embalm the bodies of those who had died. So a newborn child was given a gift that encapsulated the depth and breadth and greatness of the sacrifice he would ultimately make. In essence, Jesus Christ is the only human in the history of mankind who was born to die. He was not born to get married, have kids, make money, amass wealth, buy a house, get a job. The sole purpose of his life was his death, his death, so that others might live. And the gift of myrrh encapsulated the greatness of this sacrifice. Born to die. What an awesome burden. What a profound sacrifice. So now grounded in this understanding, I finally felt ready to reflect and prepare during this Lenten season. My reflection led me to 2 Corinthians 8, verses 13 through 15 in the NIV Bible. It reads, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, mm -hmm. and the one who gathered little did not have too little. I love this scripture. This scripture captures the meaning of human life on earth, to me. Mm -hmm to honor every day the sacrifice that Jesus made in dying so that all of us might live, our only responsibility is to pursue equality. So how do we pursue equality? Well, the first step is to be aware of inequality. Mm -hmm. We have to be aware of human suffering or in some cases seek out knowledge of human suffering. And then we have to collaborate and sacrifice in order to meet the needs of people. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. I'm gonna read the whole verse again, just because I love it. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need 
so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. So Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. Our calling is not to die. Jesus already did that. Our calling is to live and to live in such a way that we are vigilant, aware, dare I say, in pursuit of identifying any inequality that might exist because inequality cannot stand. Not when Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for all of us equally. So then when we find those who are suffering from inequity, our collective burden in honor of the great sacrifice that Jesus made is to collectively give up a morsel of our plenty, a morsel of our humanity or empathy or treasure or privilege or power so that our plenty may be applied to someone else's need. And in turn, we can expect the same will be done for us during our time of need. This is how we honor the sacrifice of Jesus. This is Christianity, is it? If aliens from Mars were to come to earth and summarize what they thought of as the Christian tradition, they'd probably say Christians believe all babies should be born and they call that pro-life. Are we pro-life? Are those of us who believe we are Christian pro-life? A 2017 study from Bloomberg found that 84% of kids born in poverty will live in poverty for the rest of their lives. And other researchers at Harvard and Berkeley and myriad other places tell us that children born in poverty are disproportionately black and brown children. To make matters worse, poverty in black and brown communities leads to premature death. That's according to JAMA and the CDC. So just like those innocents murdered by police or stricken down by COVID, poor black and brown children can expect to live a life too short. Pro-life, are we pro-life with all of the Christians in the world? reading the Bible and doing God's work, we still see innocent children who are not Jesus Christ, who did not receive the gift of myrrh at birth, born with a destiny of living a life too short. I think those aliens from Mars would say that Christians are pro-birth. They care about human birth, but not about human life even while believing that the sacrifice of Jesus was one that was made so that everyone might live. I don't wanna sit at a virtual pulpit and malign Christianity. I grew up going to church. I grew up in a Christian home and I went to church regularly and robotically. In my twenties, I found my own faith and I went to church zealously and lovingly. I married a pastor and even led the children's church enthusiastically, sharing sermonettes with little cherubs every week. But for the past eight years or so, I've had a more adversarial relationship with Christianity and with God. Christians obsessed with birth, indifferent toward life, God seeing all of this and allowing it to happen. So now, I neither go to church robotically nor zealously, not regularly, not lovingly. I do not go to church at all. 
So the idea of standing on a virtual pulpit conflicting about the Christianity I grew up with and fell in love with and then fell out of love with seemed strange to me. My being here preaching, even while I'm angry with God, but also enamored with humanity, seemed strange to me. I share all of this so you know a bit more about me. I am not a perfect Christian. I don't know how to reconcile obsession with birth and indifference toward life. But this is what I believe is the meaning of why we are all on this earth. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not gather too much. And the one who gathered little did not gather too little. So as I reflect during this Lenten season, I ask myself, what am I doing to seek out human suffering? What am I doing to better understand how people are in discomfort? And what am I doing to collectively alleviate this suffering? My hope is that all of us on this call can ask ourselves these questions and prepare to celebrate Jesus's sacrifice. My hope is that we will move toward collective action and press toward the goal of equality for every human life, for it is written, he who gathered much did not gather too much, and he who gathered little did not gather too little.